Filmmaker James Cameron has a reputation for running over budget and out of time. He also has a reputation for making visually stimulating and profitable movies loaded with action and special effects. Among them are Aliens, True Lies, The Terminator, and Terminator 2. His latest is Titanic. It was $100 million over its $100 million budget, but it is also being recognized as one of the best movies of the year. The New Yorker's Anthony Lane wrote, the film is grand and wrenching. If you are going to spend $200 million on a movie, this is the way to do it. Joining me now, the man who made Titanic, James Cameron. Welcome to this program. I'm so happy to be here. Um, great, great pleasure. I saw the film last night. It's an extraordinary film. Uh, a friend of mine who Thank was you. a film critic for an extraordinary newspaper said to me, it's her top ten, number one. And, and yeah. she just, she was overwhelmed by uh, the notion that it is a level of ambition that you expect Hollywood to do, and it hasn't been done recently. The notion that you make magic so that people come in to the theater and they get an experience beyond uh, what they might otherwise have. Yeah, yeah. Tell me what you set out to do. Well, you know, it's interesting that you say that because when I think of what it was like for me in my sort of formative years, you know, as a teenager, kind of figuring out what the world was all about, you know, going to films and see, and, and getting taken through that doorway into another world, whether it was science fiction or the past or just some other place, some other people, you know, and I, I think of what that meant to me at that time. And I think so many people in, in Hollywood, and I don't mean to diss Hollywood in any way, but they, they've lost touch with that sense of transport you know, an almost religious transport that a movie is supposed to have. Um, and I'm not saying that all films need, need to do this, but, I, you know, the thing that got me into filmmaking was the love of that sense of otherworldliness that a film can create in your mind and in your, Take in your emotions. Take some place that you cannot... Exactly. You know, out of your daily life into some place or some feeling. Sometimes it's not another place, it's another emotional place. You know, just so that you can make sure that the plumbing is all still working, yeah. you know, properly uh, and safely. You know, you don't have to go through a, a, a loss in your life. You, you, you go through a simulation of that loss or something, you know, but I mean, it's taking you somewhere emotionally or, or visually. And, uh, you know, the films that I loved when I was, when I was a kid were the big films. Yeah. You know, so Gone I, with the Wind, yeah, Gone David with the Lean's Wind, Spartacus, films. The Lean, the Lean films, 2001, A Space Odyssey, yeah. the films that really put something up there that you could not experience in your, in your life. And so with Titanic, once I'd sort of locked in on this subject... But before you do that, tell me why Titanic and why you locked in on this subject. It, it's, it's interesting. I go back and I try to find the, the germinal moment, you know, and it's, it's hard for me to locate. It was somewhere five-ish years ago. I started thinking about um, some research that I had done where I had met with uh, Dr. Robert Ballard, who discovered the wreck, and uh, when I was doing The Abyss. But I wasn't interested in, I wasn't seeing him about Titanic, I was seeing him about submersibles and remotely operated vehicles and these, these deep water robots that they're using and how all that worked. And, and uh, he, he still had not sort of gotten over Titanic. He wanted to show me his tapes of how they discovered it and so on. And there was a little infection started right there. And then <laughs> I, you had the germ. Yeah, I had the germ. <laughs> I didn't know it, it was, it was, it was incubating, you know. Yeah. And then I've always been uh, an absolute lover of history. I've never really incorporated it into my work as a filmmaker, but I've always loved history, especially the, the antiquities, you know, ancient Rome and Greece and that sort of thing, but, but all history, really. Um, and so I started reading, reading up on the history of Titanic, not just the physicality of the wreck and the high technology of finding it, but, you know, wh who were these people, you know, and what did they experience? And it, and it became, to me, such a fascinating story, as it has for many people who get sucked into the vortex of Titanic. So what did you, know? you do then? Um, then I started reading, and uh, coincidentally, uh, I, then, then I reached that, that stage, you know, which every filmmaker does, where you have this dawning, sort of creeping realization that you're probably going to make a film. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, please, God, let it not be a film about Titanic, because that's going to be a lot of work. Uh, and, and I got something in the mail, which was an invitation to a, to a screening of Titanica, which was the IMAX film. And when I saw that, I realized that these uh, scientific submersibles might be available to make to make a film because they had done it for IMAX, which is a documentary. But mm -hmm. I thought it's not that much of a greater leap to to try to get these people involved in a, in a fictional Hollywood movie. So I, I promptly, you know, f flew to Moscow, 
and uh, met with the people that had done the IMAX film and said, hey, can I use your subs? And then uh, once they agreed, then it was, now I'm making a film, I guess I better come up with a story. And so then you, you as a screenwriter, have got to create a story. Exactly. What's the objective of the story? I mean, I'm fascinated by the Titanic and everything mm -hmm. real mm -hmm. that happened, but mm -hmm. you have another obligation. You have an obligation to go beyond that and bring right. people in right. to right. see. I think, it, to sum it up very succinctly, it's make it accessible somehow. Make Titanic accessible. Not that it's inaccessible in a way, but, but get us get the audience over that hump of watching a period film yeah, yeah. where people dress differently and they speak differently and it all happened 85 years ago and who cares get them in get them involved subjectively in the event and there's only one way to do that which is through characters through characters that you really love and, and, and care about and you know we fall in love with Jack and Rose as they fall in love with each other you know up on the screen and then there's a certain point where we realize we're on the ship with them you know I'm talking about as, as an audience mm. experientially you know, in the, in the watching of the film. And I think that you can't do that in a docudrama format where you have a multiplicity of characters and you do them all perfect historical justice. We very, very carefully observed the history and carefully observed the, the, the detail of the, of, of the physicality of the film, you know, creating the sets and so on. But, but ultimately, it's, it's an experience. It's an emotional experience. It's a love story. It's, you know, if... Uh, to use one of my favorite films as, as, a, as a teenager, uh, David Lean's film, Dr. Zhivago. It's not really about the Russian Revolution. It's really about these people in this event that's greater than them. And I think Titanic, my, my film Titanic, is, is the same thing. Well, that's what great novelists do, from Tolstoy and whoever you wanted to write about. Right. You borrow energy from, yeah. the, from the chosen setting. And in some way, I think that energy is returned as well, because by being subjectively involved through this love story, I think you have a more emotional appreciation of the event itself. Now, why these two very young people uh, as your operative characters as a screenwriter? Well, the thing, my, my doorway into it was, was the wreck and the discovery of the wreck and the, and the deep, you know, uh, the deep submergence technology used to find it, you know, because I'm kind of a gearhead. So, right. you know, that's how I got interested in it. So I thought, all right, I want to do a present day kind of bookending you know, technique where we see the wreck as, as she is now and, and, and juxtapose it with what it was like back then. So, and I thought, you know, that's too sterile. I, I want to have a, a, um, a human interface between those two worlds. Okay, so that's a survivor. All right, now if I'm telling a story, a love story, uh, that happened to someone in 1912, they have to either be really, really old now or really, really young then or yeah, both. Right. And so, you know, I, I wound up with, you know, my protagonist being 102 in present day. Now, was there any historical character that provided any insight to do it with, as you did it? Well, you know, I mean, they're, they're the, the most elderly survivors that actually remember Titanic have, have died recently, unfortunately. Uh, but Before they were seeing your movie. Uh, yes, un unfortunately, although it, it might have been traumatic for yeah. them, so uh, you know, I, I don't know about that. But uh, you know, Edith Hazeman was, I think, 99 or maybe even 100 when she when she died just uh, a year or so ago. Um, so you know, there's a historical precedent for people being still alive who remember the event clearly. Um, my sort of model of, as a character for Rose was an artist in in Ojai in California, Beatrice Wood who's 103 years old, and I, I, wanted to, I wanted to meet and interview someone when I, when I was in the writing stage who was that age and had a very exciting and passionate life, and I wanted to see what her memories were like, how vivid they were, you know, because this is really a movie about memory. It's a movie about what you, what you take away from, from an event, from a, from a loss like that, and how you go on. And uh, so I was really very interested in her. So, so, um, uh, I told her that, that uh, I wanted to model my 102-year-old my character upon her if that was all right, although she had nothing to do with Titanic. It was really just the fact that she was alive at that time. As we record this, we are at one disadvantage, which is that people haven't seen the movie yet right. because it hasn't opened, right. and therefore um, they don't know what we're talking about in part. I want to introduce them to that. The, char the story that's important to know for someone as part of this conversation mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. that this is a story in which you find someone right you you it's a story of people who are going to the titanic looking for mm -hmm. riches wealth, wealth. yeah they right get plunder by finding they plunder. want to plunder they're pirates you know and they find and they're looking for jewelry mm -hmm. and they find the story 
of this woman, and she leads them to the story right. of this great romance between uh, a young woman who's going over to marry right. a very wealthy man in Philadelphia, right. uh, and she falls in love with a young man who happens only to get on the Titanic mm -hmm. because he had a poker game in which he won a ticket, and he's in steerage, and the two of them engage. Uh, this is good. It's very succinct. You got it. That's good. <laughs> and, and the story is off and running right. in terms of what happened to him. She right. is pulled towards him and rebels against the man right. who would be her. He's fiance. an artist, a free spirit. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah. And he paints her picture and right. painting and, and, and there's a beautiful uh, diamond mm -hmm. as part of it. The male lead, uh, why'd you choose him? Well, Leonardo, I mean, I think anyone, once, once you know, they've seen the film will, will get it. They've seen his other stuff and his characters Romeo have been... Romeo and Juliet. And yes. And Romeo and Juliet is a very passionate, very, very, you know, a very uh, uh, full of life character. Um, I, I wanted Jack to be, to have a, a little bit of that quality. Jack Dawson. But Jack Dawson, his character in the, in the film. I want him to have a lot of that. Um, I also wanted him to have this kind of very easy, uh, almost Buddha-like... Uh, calm or in, in inner inner peace. When he comes into a situation, he doesn't care how rich or or how ostentatious the setting. He can just sit down and he can just he can just talk to somebody. I told I told Leo, you're you're a guy who can shake somebody's hand and Xerox their soul, <laughs> and it's what makes him a great artist or potentially a great artist because he's still an unknown, you know, yeah. in, in this film. And and and, and uh, Rose Rose uh, is almost the opposite when we first see her. She's very, she's very stiff. She's very interior. She's obviously quite, quite troubled. We don't exactly know why. She's under a cloud. And then, but as she emerges, you know, like a, like a butterfly from a cocoon, as the film progresses, under Jack's influence or kind of catalysm, if you will, um, she uh, turns out to be very similar to him. Very, uh, you know, she has a joyful, very creative spirit as they well. They strike each other's spirit. Absolutely. Roll tape. Here is a scene between the two of them. Okay, so we're now introduced to the characters. I mean, right. Those two, right. we saw the, the Rose looking as um, Jack is talking about. Isn't Louis. she beautiful? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so they're off and Titanic is off. Tell, uh, in the media, tell me about the difficulties of making the movie mm -hmm. uh, and, and the financing and sacrifices you had to make to get it on the air and what your determination That'll was. <laughs> That'll be a mouthful. Right. Tell me about that. Um, and how do you go about making this kind of movie? Okay. Now that you've got your story set, now you've got your character set, now you've got your actress set, mm -hmm. now you've got to make a movie. Well, it all starts with the pitch, yeah. right? So I, so I go in and I sit down at 20th Century Fox and I say, okay, guys, here's the picture, all right? It takes place in 1912. Uh, it's a period drama. Uh, we can't have any stars because they're, the, the characters are too young, and uh, it's probably going to cost north of $100 million. <laughs> and everybody dies at the end and there's no sequel. <laughs> no sequel possibility. What, what yeah, do you think? Right. Sound good? And they're like, mm, let us think about this. Yeah. No, it, it's, it's difficult. So you told them right up front, we're talking about yeah, more than a hundred Three hour dollars. movie, yeah. more than a hundred. And if you make a three hour movie, that means that it can't be played but so many times in a mm. theater and they're not thrilled about that. Exactly. Plus, you know, you can't have a, a, a toy line sprung right. out of it. Right. You can't exactly. have indefinite number of sequels. Theme park attraction is right out. Yeah. You know, you go in, but you don't come out. <laughs> but, uh, you know, so it, it's, a, it's a tougher sell. It, it goes against the grain of, of Hollywood wisdom to do a picture on this scale uh, at, in, that, in that budget range without all of those things that give them comfort. So what do they say? Let us see the they script. They you're James Cameron, go. Well, yeah, there was a bit of that, and I have because a good... Because you had a little deal with them anyway. I have a relationship with them, and they trust me, and we've gone into precarious places before and come out of it looking good. So, you know, they, they, it, it held them back that one step, and I said, let me write the script, and I'll show you that. So then they read the script, and they're, they're literate people. They could see it on the page. They could run the picture in their head, and they said, you know what? We really hate it that we like this so much, because now we're going to have to make it, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Uh, so we went into it knowing or thinking that we knew but the But this dangers. does not describe what you have done so brilliantly here. Here, and I'm not the one to say that, Thank but you. critics say that, which is the way you have used all kinds of things mm -hmm. and the fact that you had to build this boat 
in where Mexico somewhere right, in, in Mexico that is nine tenths this what, what was that it's big? virtually full scale there's just parts of it that we didn't build yeah but the part that we did build is full scale it's, it was 60 feet from the boat deck down to the water and when we were loading those lifeboats now, boy, is that yeah. in the script and, and how all the stuff that you're gonna do the dynamics of what special effects mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean you know we describe the scenes but sometimes there, there's you know a line that says uh, it says something and then when you actually get into it it's a million dollars to to <laughs> shoot to, that to one make line you see it yeah exactly yeah. to see it I mean you know, we first thing we did was we built a big model of the ship, yeah. 25 feet long, and we acted out all the scenes on deck with toy soldiers yeah. and a little video camera and studied what the angles would need to be and learned our environment. And then we decided this will have to be an effect, that'll have to be a set, and then there's a gray area in between. Then Paramount gets involved. Mm -hmm. That was later. We actually were already greenlit and already officially making the film. Kate and Leo were on. I was casting away. We were building like crazy. And then Fox wanted a, a partner to, to share the pain. Maybe to get a little nervous, the did pain. they? Um, <laughs> yeah, right. No, it was a given. It was a given. In fact, Peter Chernin, you know, who was, yes, who was running the, the, you know, the film uh, yeah. division at Fox at that time, uh, he's now, you know, the capo de tutti copy there. News Corp. News Corp, right. Um, he said, I want a partner on this. And I said, fine, you find the partner. I'll go, I'll go start making the film. So we'll divide and conquer, mm -hmm. you know. So they brought in Paramount and... Uh, For 65 million? Yeah, Paramount was capped, and, and obviously they've 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 been happy with it that. Was deal. It, it was a great deal. It was a great. It turned out to be a great deal for them. Yeah. Yeah. Now the story about you is that you have given up what, and just going to take your screenwriter's you salary, know, which is sizable. Yeah, yeah. But you've given up your points and all that, or not? Is that yes? True? No, that's true. That's true. I, it it evolved. You know, it's not something that 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 uh, I, I probably if I had been told in advance you're gonna work for three years for nothing <laughs> I would have said thanks very much <laughs> you know uh, as much as I love this film and as much as I am passionate about it I mean I, I, it's not something I probably would have gone into here comes my little criticism mm -hmm. I wanted to see more I'm thick conversation skin, <laughs> I'm thick skin you can do it. fire away I haven't read this <laughs> I want to see more. that's what excites me about mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. the two things excited me about it I mean I like the love story as well and you and, Jacob Astor's on this. Right. He goes down with the ship. Right. Harry, uh, Guggenheim, I forgot what his mm -hmm. first name was. Mm -hmm. Benjamin. Benjamin Guggenheim yeah. goes down with the ship. Right. And lots of other people go down. Right. And they're great stories. Mm -hmm. I wanted to hear more about what they were saying to each other. Right. You see right. it, but you don't hear much conversation. The I musicians am. play, yes. and the guy says to the other guy, I'm honored to have played with you. I, I, I like that moment. That's a nice moment. I did too. I did too. Um, but I wanted to hear more of that. And was that a conscious decision because it would detract from the story that's engaged us so far, which is the romance and will they make it or yes. who's going to make it? It was an editing decision. I actually shot more of that stuff. Yeah. And I was very enthralled with it myself when I was making the film. But ultimately, that was the territory that had been covered before. I thought, you know, we did it, we, we did it very well and I had very good actors. So it was, it, was a, it was worthy to spend the time to shoot it. In the cutting room, I found myself focusing more on Jack and Rose because I felt that, I felt personally that one could be very factual about Titanic and very correct and not be as truthful emotionally. And that in a way sometimes by spending more time with the fictional characters it puts you in, emotional, in, in an emotional place of openness yeah. to the greater tragedy, you know, without the specific details. And I think that the audience does go through this kind of experiential curve where where they do allow themselves to open up and, and at the end when when you experience the thing that has never been filmed about Titanic before the aftermath the immediate aftermath of the people in the water and the moral dilemma of the people in the lifeboats you're very sensitized at that point and and I think it has a lot of power for that reason but it was a question of orchestrating it, and there were too many notes you know but it will put it in the laser disc so I'll, right. send, I'll send you a copy of the okay, laser disc right. and you can see yeah, all that yeah. historical stuff we're going to see now a scene from the boat has hit the iceberg mm -hmm. uh, and they know the guy who designed the boat knows it's got two hours I mean it's a magnificent story and you do see some of that right. uh, individual characters you've gotten to know right. you see how right. they're gonna go to their death yes they choose the place yes and the mood did you know about this oh yeah it's it's all very very carefully but uh, the ship's designer went there yes yes Thomas Andrews who, who designed the ship and built it spent three years of his life on on his baby was on board, was the first one to really know that they were, they were doomed, that the ship was doomed. Because they're going into five of the holes yeah, rather than five instead of four. four, four right. right. So close, you know, it was all just by a very tiny margin that it all happened. Yeah. 
and he would have known that. And the heartbreak of that character has been one of the, the things that fascinated me most about the historical side of Titanic, that he was there, that he was on board. He chose to stay and die with his creation. Yeah. He chose to stand at the fireplace in the first class smoking room, you know, what, arguably one of the most beautiful places on the ship that he had created, and go down with the now ship. How do we know that? He was seen there by a steward who ran through moments before the ship actually you know, went up uh, to, to an extreme angle and broke up. So instead of the steward running through, I, I play it in the film as if the steward has already gone through, mm -hmm. and then my two characters come in and see him standing there and ask him and why do, he's not trying. And how do we know that the captain went to his... He was seen going to the wheelhouse, wheelhouse. moments before the, 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 uh, the front end of the boat deck plunged under the surface and the wheelhouse was covered with water. You know, it's, ne it's not known exactly, and his body was never recovered. Most of the people who floated off the ship, uh, wearing their life belts, their life preservers, were recovered. You know, the bodies were recovered because yeah. they were kept... They, they were froze to death in a matter of what? Right. Hypothermia. They, in they, what, 15 minutes? Or it, it varied by individual, probably anywhere from a couple of minutes to as much as 45 minutes. You know, the people in the lifeboats described the moaning and the screaming. You know, it was quite, quite horrific, really quite heart-wrenching. People screaming about the cold and... Save us, come back come back and save us. They knew those lifeboats were out there somewhere in the darkness and they were in 28 degree water screaming for their lives and the boats didn't come back. Why didn't they come back? Because everybody was terrified. They terrified were, was, if they came back to be sucked into the whatever? Or? It's hard to understand. I mean, I think you have to put yourself in where they were and how inconceivable the event was. I mean, I imagine them being the same as the, as the people who are wandering around after the bomb went off in, in Hiroshima. Just stunned. Not able to deal with the situation. It was too... It was so much bigger than them, you know? And so they're out in these lifeboats, they're, they're, they're chilly, they're freezing in the middle of the, of, the, of the big black ocean, and the enormity of it, you know, hasn't even sunk in yet. And they hear these people screaming, and I think they were just gut scared, you know? And so you, you ask yourself, if I was in that boat, and I looked around and I saw a lot of empty seats, and I knew in the back of my mind, even if I didn't want to admit it, that we could save people, what would you do? You know, that's really the, the most interesting moral dilemma. And so only one guy went back. This, you know, cocky young Welsh officer, fifth officer low. He got a bunch of boats together. He transferred passengers over until he got one completely empty boat that could hold 70 people. And he got a couple sailors and they rowed back. And we, we see that. Yeah. So. And, and, and they did save a couple. They did save a couple yeah, that but hadn't one, frozen at that time. Yeah, but they got there a little too late to really do much good. Wow. Roll tape. This is a scene after the boat, the Titanic, the boat that could not sink has hit the iceberg. Let me talk now about making the movie. Oops. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's going to hurt. Mean, well, that's where it became, you know, tough. That's yeah, where... That's, that's the hard stuff. Yeah. That's the hard stuff to shoot. How did you do it? Uh, in general, in yeah, a general give sense? Give me a sense of the, of the overwhelming challenge mm -hmm. of making a movie that tries to take you onto a boat that is sinking into the ocean. Well, first of all, the ship was huge, and it took us a long time just to sort of get our arms around the enormity of this thing, the, the, the physical setting of the film, and how we were going to create that. It took us months and months of, of engineering and figuring out how we were going to angle the sets and so on, and then how we would use visual effects to complement it all. But really, when you're out there on the shooting day, the logistics are the staggering part. You know, you've got literally maybe a thousand extras, and they all have to be in perfect period wardrobe, and they all have to be you know, told what to do and how to perform. You Perfect know. period wardrobe you sent people around the world looking for. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes. Well, <laughs> well we, like I said, we tried to be accurate and all, yeah. the, all the costumes are very accurate to the period. But, uh, and then to get all these people into the water, I mean, that scene w was in, in cramped quarters and we were dealing with large volumes of water and that's very potentially dangerous for the crew and for, for cast and stunt people and so on. It all has to be done exactly correctly, which, you know, Knockwood, fortunately, it, it was. But, you know, in some of the other scenes, we'd have 200 people on a, on a big hydraulic set of the ship, and we'd just lower that into the water, and they'd all get swept off by the water pouring in and pouring over it, and that all had to be done safely. We, we, we hired a lot of uh, lifeguards as extras, you know, so they had their wetsuits on underneath yeah. their, their period jackets and so on. But, uh, you know, the logistics of it are staggering. The safety requirements, the safety protocols are staggering. I don't think any, any one of us, and we all, you know, had experience doing big pictures, really knew what it was going to take to make this, to make this film what until we got out there. What was the toughest challenge for you? I think, um, well, artistically the toughest challenge was the chemistry of the love story because yeah. all that other I stuff doesn't it. count. Yeah. Right. But, but you've got that. Right, but from a, from a production standpoint, I think the toughest challenge was, was uh, safety. 
at all times. You know, we had thousands of amps of electricity going into the set, which is in salt water, with hundreds of people around it and on it, and keeping it electrically safe, you know, keeping it safe in, in water. I mean, you know, I, I love to dive. I've been a scuba diver since I was 16. I've spent you a went, lot of time. Well, speaking of that, mm -hmm. you went down three times? How many yes, times you 12 times. 12 times? Yes. Now, why was that important for you, to see the Titanic lying on the bottom of the ocean near Newfoundland? Well, first of all, let's be very frank here. You know, once I had the the possibility of the opportunity, you could not have stopped me. <laughs> so it was a because question. Because what? Do you had to well, see it because you're going to spend five years of your life? I think that I think that that might have been at the core of it. I mean, I I, I justified it by the fact that we didn't go there for research. Yeah. We went there to shoot part of the yeah. film. We actually shot scenes from the from the movie that would have had to have been recreated. Yeah. You know, we would have had to recreate it all with models, and that has its own price tag dangling from it. So yeah. when, when it seemed that the numbers were close to a wash, then uh, it was, let's go. Let's really shoot the Titanic. And that was exciting. But I, I don't think What's I could have... What's it like, then? It's very black. You know, there's no sunlight. It's freezing cold. It's as sterile and barren as the moon. And it's almost like having gone to another planet. And, but yet here's this historical object there. You know, so there's a surrealism almost to that. And then as you, as you make repeated dives and, and you spend time with the ship, you become familiar with, oh, there's the first class entrance. There's the window to the captain's yeah. quarters. There's the davit for boat number one, which was launched with so-and-so in it, you know, Cosmo yeah. Duff Gordon. And yeah. you know who were, who were the people that were in the boats. And so it becomes the, the human face of the drama is, is superimposable on what you're seeing through the, through the viewport as you're seeing it, you know, if, you, if you've done your research. And so it, you, you come away with it with, a, with a, uh, an umbilical to the event that I don't think I would have had going through endless books and research. If someone, this is not a new idea, if someone came to you and said, we now have technology to raise the boat, you would say what? I, I think it's, it should be left where it it's is. It's a tomb and therefore it's do a, not disturb It's a tomb and, and, and it's a memorial, you know, and its inaccessibility, I think, gives it a certain stature. It's like a memorial at the top of Mount Everest, you know. Uh, you know, it, 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 filming it in place has so much more power than seeing it outside of a hotel in, in, in Las Vegas or something. You know, I mean, where would you put it? Where would you put it that would, that would have emotional power? You know, it would only be devalued. But, but frankly, I don't think that technology will ever exist. I mean, the thing weighs 48,000 tons and it's stuck in the mud, you know. So it's going to be down there, I think, until it rusts away. And you felt what down there, other than the fact it was like the moon and like it's cold and like well, it's dark? But it, yeah, that's, that's your initial feeling. You, is it, are you overwhelmed by the notion of there are people here who yes. died here? Well, not, maybe not ghosts, because I don't necessarily believe in ghosts. But, but you know, I, I, was, I was able to visualize what happened. And we took the robot inside the, the, uh, the ship, and we looked around, and you could see What's the robot? Shand the, the ROV, the little, you know, little orange robot that you see in the film, we actually took it inside. We, we didn't intend on doing that, but, but we did it. And you can see the kind of the, the ghostly grandeur still, still there. And no one had, had photographed that. So that was very exciting, but also emotionally overwhelming. And it's, it's hard to exactly say what the emotional impact of that is, other than the fact that the, f the film is the result of that. You know, the, 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 the creative decisions made on the film is, a, is directly a result of that. Wanting to, you know, you asked me before about what was in and what was out and why, and, and why wasn't there more of the historical thing. It's because I felt that I had to convey an emotional truth or an emotional reality of the, of the event. Uh, and that was my mission when I, left, when I left the ship, when I left the shipwreck, if that makes sense. I mean, it sounds no, kind of no, hokey, no. But, but, you know, you've, you've interviewed the people that in the, in the past that right. found the wreck. Matt Ballard. And, and they, they talk in very profoundly emotional terms about the experience. And it almost sounds a little hokey and self-serving unless you've been there and spent the time. And then it, it has an effect on you. Roll tape. This is one more scene, uh, end of the film, where they're going through... Uh, their own frantic effort to stay alive. They are on the very tip of the... Uh, right, uh, right at the back. At the, at, right at, uh, at the bow. Poop deck. Yeah, yeah. and it's yeah. going to tip up like right. that and slide, and they're all going to slide off. Right. You said only three people survived that in yes, actuality. Yes, I think two or, th two or three. One was the baker who actually climbed over the railing as the ship went up vertical. He climbed over the railing and stood on the hull of the ship and rode it down like an elevator. And he was, you know, drunk out of his face. 
He'd, take, he'd, dr he'd drunk an entire fifth of scotch. At, at the moment it's happened? Or, or, uh, just a little bit earlier, because he and assumed so he, he was going to die. He rides it down. He rides it down, he gets in and the why water. Why wasn't he sucked into the bottom? Of well, I saw, many people were, but I think the suction wasn't as great as everybody thinks it was. There was probably some upwelling of air that maybe yeah. pushed him back up. And he ended up in a boat, yeah. I assume. Yeah, well, he, he clung on to the overturned lifeboat and uh, half in and half out of the water for a couple of hours, his legs freezing in 28 degree water. And they were they were saved the following morning by Carpathia. Yeah, and I assume that in the reality, when you see this film, you want to go back and read this stuff. What's the best book on the Titanic? Well, the the uh, the illustrated history, uh, yeah. uh, which is a, a a more recent book by Don Lynch, uh, illustrated by Ken Marshall. That was a big influence on us. We called it the Bible. Yeah. You know, we'd be working on a shot, and I'd say, "Turn to page thirty-five of the Bible." That's yeah. a, <laughs> you know, so that's a that's a very good source. And of course, Walter Lord's books, A Night to Remember. Very, very Everybody well researched. Which yeah. was made into a movie, wasn't it? And made into a movie. And Did I you think see that a, sure. a lot? And sure. Was it instructive for you at all? Yeah, I think it's a very good film. I think it's a very good earnest film. A, a factual, you know, docu docudrama kind of approach to the material, but right. a very good film. Now, let's talk about you as a director. <laughs> no, must we? <laughs> <laughs> the first cinematographer leaves after a couple right, of weeks, right? right? What was the problem? Just... Uh, that was that was a sort of mutual thing. He, he uh, had been directing himself, and he, I think he was more comfortable with the type of filmmaker who spends all their time with the actors and isn't so concerned with the image and likes to be kind of the maestro of that area and that's very very good for some directors but I like to be involved in everything I'm very I'm very hands-on. Tell me what kind of filmmaker you are so, because there uh, I think much has been written about that. I think hands-on and and not um, not because of some you know aberrational psychological need to have control it's really because I love all aspects of filmmaking. I really, really love it. I, you know, if we were if we were doing a scene, I'd be moving this table to get it to the right spot under the lights. I mean, yeah, I love to do it all. For me, it's a tactile experience. I don't know any, any other way to do it. I didn't go to film school, so I sort of don't know how you're supposed to do it. Yeah. I only know sort of how I always did it. And I started out with two or three people and a camera and did everything myself. And it's just sort of scaled up from there. But my methodology is the same. How did you get to make movies then? Um, you know, there's always an element of luck and being in the right place at the right time. I, uh, but there's, you, you also have to be very determined and very, very focused. Um, I gave myself a, a free film school education by, by I, I worked as a truck driver and, and on weekends I would go down to USC and sit in the library all day and read books on how films were made. And, and it cost me the cost of the Xeroxing. <laughs> of, the, yeah. of these, you know, doctoral dissertations on optical printing and things that I was in. I made big binders of stuff. And I basically sort of, it was like putting yourself through law school, you know, on the, yeah. uh, the closed cover before striking school yeah. of law, you know. It was like that. And then uh, I went to work for Roger Corman, uh, working at the, the lowest, lowest of the low budget. You know, so many people have gone through that. Mm -hmm. What is it about Roger Corman's films and the opportunity he gives you that turns out people who know how to make movies? I think it's the survivors of that experience that, that know how to make movies. There's, there's a lot of culling going on there, you know, like the, like the baby sea turtles going down to the ocean. You know, most of them get eaten by the seagulls and only a few make it. The ones that come through that and survive and still want to make films, they've been through hell, they've been through fire, you know. And so it, what's the hell and what's the fire? Well, it, you know, it's mutually, it, it, it's, what, it's what you th uh, would call mutual exploitation. He's exploiting you by not paying you anything, <laughs> yeah. and you're exploiting him by getting by access to, uh, to film the, equipment right. and, getting a, and, and getting the opportunity to say, I worked on a real movie. Yeah, yeah. it was a little movie, but it was a real movie. Um, and uh, the hell is, you know, hideously long hours and no pay. Who influenced you? Who movies would you watch and say, yeah? Everything. Everything good. You know, I mean, I, I, I love science fiction, so when I, was, when I was a kid, 2001 had a big effect on me because I wanted to know how things were done. Um, but uh, everything, everything. I mean, when, when I was in high school, that was the time that I, that I fell utterly, madly, passionately in love with movies. And what were the movies that were coming out in the late 60s? It was Easy Rider and Catch-22 and Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. It was all over the map. It was Independence and the, the last of the, of the big spectacles. You know, Dr. Zhivago came out in, the, I think, 69 or 70. And, you know, so you've got the, you've got the last of the, of the giant, you know, Hollywood studio spectacles for a time, you know, mm -hmm. and you've got the, this emergence of this whole independent cinema as a concept, you know, so it was such a fertile time. Do you believe this film, if it makes as much money as some predicted might, uh, and it's got to make a lot of money just to break even. Right, exactly. If it costs, the figures 
two hundred million. Some say it was at high as two hundred thirty-five million. I mean, is it to make the picture? It was two hundred. It was two hundred. So yeah. you're saying it was two hundred? It's forget to pretty much right on the money. I mean, it was a little under, and then when we pushed back in post-production, it slipped yeah. over. So what does it have to make to break even? I mean, with all the international da 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 da. Well, probably in the in the neighborhood of between three and three fifty. You know, if you do that in a second. Uh, you can do it. You can do it. I mean, uh, true lies made That's more than that. That's going to happen. You know, it's yeah. a global market. It's a global market. So you, you have to remember that a, a film that travels well, that has a lot of visual power to it, and the film will, I believe, travel well because we've had tremendous response, you know, in, in the foreign markets as well. Uh, um, you know, it, it can make a, a multiple of what it makes in the U.S. and Canada. Now think what you went through. Scream. I'd rather not. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to talk more about that too. Scream just opened over the weekend. Thirty-nine million dollars. That's awesome. That's, that's awesome. Great. More power it? to them. Yeah, it's Wes Craven, and I, that's I a West. great opening. I mean, yeah. it's, a, it's a fabulous opening. You know, it's um, a film that probably cost them what forty million a million. And that's time. that's part of the fun too. You know, I mean, part of the fun is is that you have this kind of David and Goliath environment, and, and a little film can come from nowhere. I was so proud when I made The Terminator, and we went up against Dune in two thousand and ten. Yeah. For the, the, the science them. fiction dollar, yeah. these, mon these these you know mega pictures, and and we creamed them, you know. I mean that's that's part of the fun. But I think that that you know Scream Scream and Titanic are so such divergent audiences. You know, it's really you know are people going to go see Titanic and have a great cinematic experience? They shouldn't worry about Clearly how much the are. picture costs. Yeah. They shouldn't worry about it. You know, a ticket costs seven fifty or eight bucks, or I think a little more here in New York, but. You know, it's the same amount to go see Scream, which is, I think, you know, a $20 million film, maybe, maybe a little more. When you watch this film, what are the moments in it that sort of are very, very, very special? What's at the top of your list of scenes, moments, you know, or a visual experience that you look at with great... The, there are two, and they both are at the bow of the ship, and I think it's because having gone to the wreck, the bow is the part that is so intact that you can really see a ship. Um, when Jack sees the dolphins, and there's a, there's a, it's a purely cinematic moment, you know, of, of, of acting, of his, his character, of the music, yeah. and uh, the spirit, and, and bringing the ship back to life was more exciting for me than sinking it again. You know, I mean, I think most people that watch the film you know, would disagree with that. Recreating the grandeur of the Titanic yes. was exciting yes. for you. Yeah, it was. Uh, or seeing it now, yeah. seeing that, that accomplishment is more fun for me. We saw a little bit of that in the opening thing that I ran in, in the introduction, where right. you see it moving out and right. the tug sort of leading the way. Right. Uh, what you else? You can't appreciate the sinking if you don't appreciate the ship and the accomplishment of the, of the ship and what it represented to those people. And you can't appreciate what they experienced if you can't put yourselves in their place. And, and create a kind of amnesia about what the name Titanic means, so that you can, you have to, you have to go into the film experiencing their optimism and their their joy at being on this greatest sort of s achievement of their civilization. What's the most heroic story you know, and the most cowardly story you know about the Titanic? Well, I think you know uh, Bruce Ismay is probably the most cowardly story because here's a guy who was probably, if if any one person was responsible. was responsible, it would have been him. I mean, because the, buck, the buck stopped with him, and, and he's the one that urged the captain to go a little faster. Go and, faster, set the record. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and then what he do? And then he got off on a lifeboat. When he looked around that deck, and he knew that there were still over a thousand people on that ship, and he got into a lifeboat and saved himself. Those people were his responsibility. And whatever happened to him? He died in obscurity, a hermit. I mean, not a hermit, but in, a, a recluse. You know, he was he, he was never uh, found guilty of any you know uh, legal culpability. But because, he knew. But he knew, and everybody else knew. You know, and it yeah. was just not it, it was just not an honorable thing. And how much of that was it as this ship went to its grave? Oh, very much. You know, I mean, it, it's it's interesting to project ourselves into that situation with our you know 1997 mindset, and I've tried to do that a lot, but. There, there was a fundamental difference in, in the way that people saw the world in those days, and people were, I think, more willing to die a noble death in those days than, than people might be now. I think the women and children might have, you know, footprints on their backs, you know, if they got today, between... Yeah. Today? Yeah, today. You thought something yeah. about courage that was there might yeah. not be here today. Yeah, I think there's... I mean, I, I think it's also overdone. I think this wistfulness for a different time and a different sort of moral standard is overdone. I think that 
the, the, the veneer of civilization did get stripped away on Titanic. I think a lot of people who probably thought they were very civilized and very gentlemanly did not behave that way when push came to shove. It was imminent, they yeah. did the cowardly thing. Yeah, but there are still these, these incandescent moments of, of you know, uh, Benjamin Guggenheim dressing. What did Benjamin Guggenheim do? He went back to his room, he put on his formal white tie and long, long tail coat, and he came down and top hat and came down and told the stewards, I don't want a life preserver. Um, I've, I've dressed in my best and I'm going to tie as a gentleman. Give me a brandy. Yeah, <laughs> well, I added that. <laughs> but, but I was trying to get into the spirit of who this man was, yeah. you know, and there, there was a panache, there was a style, you know, as well. Who else? Uh, John Jacob Astor. What did he do? You know, do we know? The, he was the richest man on the boat, one of the richest men in America. And um, do we know he what put he did? It, he was very much in love with his, his he, he was, uh, I think, 48 or 50. He was very much in love with his 18-year-old wife, Madeline, who was pregnant with their child. He put her into a lifeboat and said goodbye and stood back. You know, I think that would be a hard thing for us. I mean, I think, you know, in, in America especially, we have this idea that the wealthy will always get over. They'll always, you know, they'll Find always find a way, they'll, they'll buy themselves in. And I show, I show a character doing that as well, because you can't tell me that didn't happen. But the exceptions, you know, the, the John Jacob Astors, the Benjamin Guggenheims are, are famous for that. You know, I mean, that's what's now, so inspiring about this. Now, where's this scene of John Jacob Astor saying goodbye to his 18-year-old bride? I don't have that in the film. I mean, I used but Guggenheim as a represent... I will see that at represent... some point in my life. Yeah, okay. All right. When I send you the laser disc, <laughs> then you'll see it. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, um, as you made this film, and you're thinking and knowing and it's working and all this kind of stuff and then you uh, by the time it was postponed did you pretty much finished it no we still had we still had work I mean we postponed it a, a couple of months before we were supposed to release it so we just we just sort of reapportioned the work to a more like livable schedule what was your deepest reservation as you sort of went into the backstretch going towards finishing the film um, Reservation. What sort of fear did you have there? What well, I, we were we were all petrified. I mean, that, we had done this big picture. It was clearly being misunderstood in the media. People were lumping it in with the other disaster films. It was Waterworld uh, all over. Yeah, not that so much. That didn't bother me as much as as getting lumped in with with Volcano and Dante's Peak, fine films, but disaster films. And and I knew that that's not what we were making. And, and everybody sort of had written it off as a disaster film, and they didn't really understand what we were trying to and do. And you want to say to them what? Uh, you know, ultimately, you can't say anything. The movie says it for you. So, yeah, but you want so, to say this is a lo this is Titanic, the love story. This is a love story. This is a love story. It's about people. It's about the it's about the human heart and the human spirit. And you know what? You can say that till you're blue in the face, and it just sounds like a boring movie that nobody wants yeah. to see. You know, you have to go and experience the film to know what that means. You know, because you, you see so many films that that where people say those exact things that I just said, and boy, they're just dreadfully boring. You know now, what I mean? Here's what's interesting, and I want to explore with you a second. What fascinates you and what fascinates me is acts of courage and cowardly right. and, and, and wonderful stories of love and mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. That's what interests you. Right. right. Self-sacrifice. Self-sacrifice. All that. Yeah. The human dimension. Right. You could do that without all the special effects, without all this other stuff. So why is that, that necessary? That wouldn't be any fun. All right. So just tell me why. Because, it, it, because if you were asking people to spend $8 or whatever it is, you're asking them, I'm going to give you an experience that you can't get anywhere else. Right. Is that what right. you're going to tell them? We're going to put on a show. We're going to put on, We're going a, show to put on a show. We're going to show you what it's but, like when a boat goes down. Yeah. This but is it, how it happens. This is what it looks like. Yeah. This is what it feels like. This is what it would be. You're there. This is the closest thing to being there, you're there. in my movie. You're there. And to me, that was also a goal. That was also an important goal. You know, you could do, you, and, and I, I look forward very much to doing a film that doesn't require the visual effects and the big sets and all that sort of thing. Because I know I can do that. You know, and, and I enjoy that part of the work very, very much as a writer and as a director. Um, and you're right, you can do a film that doesn't have all those things in it. There's something about Titanic that I thought if you're going to visit this subject in the late 90s with all the stuff that we can do now, let's do it right almost for the first time. And I, I don't mean to put down the other films, but they didn't have access to the technology that we have now, you know, 30 years later. We can do it better. We can do it more real. On the set, you are tyrannical? Well, I'll, I'll address that. <laughs> <laughs> you are demanding. Mm -hmm. I'll uh, come to that. You're willing to risk the people not liking you in order to get your movie made. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You not the cast. I think it's important to have a good relationship with the cast. When did, and did you and and Kate end up okay? We were we were always okay. Kate, story? yeah, that's that. You know, uh, 
you know, Kate and I had a, had a great time during during the film. It was a very hard picture, and, and for her, an unexpectedly difficult and stressful experience to Why? go through. Length, you know, she had done much smaller films. Uh, the physicality of it, you know, she wasn't used to that. She hadn't done the sort of films that I've that I've done in the in the past. Um, and uh, but uh, but we had a great you know artistic bond on the film. I was very much inside her head, and. Uh, and the same with same with Leo. And the other thing is, see, see, the thing that that does get I think misunderstood is it was a cult of perfectionism. I mean, no one is more of a perfectionist than Leonardo. No one is more of a perfectionist than they Kate. They match your sense. Oh, of absolutely. I mean, we would egg each other on. I mean, it was it was it was tragic for the crew yeah. because we'd be on take ten and just getting gleeful, you know. Uh, and and Billy Zane the same way, and and Francis Fisher. I mean, How these good are people. Is Leo? Leo is unlimited. Unlimited. He's 21, 22 years old, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. He, he, Leo is a guy who fortunately understands his gift well enough to, to be able to go to the hardest thing he can find. He will always seek out the hardest thing. What His, does that mean? Well, he will seek out the hardest character, the, the most challenging thing, the thing to prove himself against. You know, so he's a lot like me in that sense. He looks for the challenge. <laughs> no and, kidding. And, and he didn't want to make this picture because he didn't think playing a quote-unquote leading man, a kind of, he, you know, I think he thought it was going to be kind of a square-jawed action hero, which of course he's not. He's a very complex character, but he's also very pure of heart, so he wasn't finding the handles as an actor you know the, the 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 sort of the props, if you will. You know, the, the, the I always kid him. I say that the, the tick or the or the hump. You know, the Richard the Third thing. He wasn't finding the thing that you know. It took me three months to convince him that it was very very hard to do what he ultimately wound up doing. What would you do differently? Uh, that's a good. That's a that's a very good question. And I've been thinking about it recently for all the obvious reasons. But I think what we did wrong was we tried to build a studio facility and one of the biggest most complex sets in, in recent film history simultaneously. And we had two construction entities who had given us numbers for what this was going to cost, who then had to function in the same space at the same time. And the numbers were no longer relevant. And it was all about a date, a release date. You know, and we shouldn't have tried to go for a date. We should have tried to make the film on its own terms. You know. uh, and I think that there would, have been, there would have been considerable savings. I think it still would have cost more than we originally, we originally thought, but I think it would have doubled. Well, you know, it didn't. I mean, we went off. We we started the picture at about 125 million, and we wound up at 200. So yeah. it wasn't quite double, but it's a, it's a it's a fair cop that it's considerably more than my my other films. You know, yeah. Terminator 2 was a 100 million dollar film. It was budgeted at 90. You know, so it went up 10 percent. I mean, this film went up considerably more than that. And and but I've taken my lumps. You know, I mean, I've I've put my all my dough back into the film to try to ease it for the studio. I've gotten myself out of I the way. That was just stunning sacrifice on your part. I mean, I mean, you know, you that you did that. Now, if you hadn't done that, would the film have been made? Oh yeah, we were well into it. It would have been made. There probably would have been compromises. My relationship with the studio would have been very strained. They were looking at a scenario where, you know, as you as you were pointing out earlier, it's it's going to be uh, difficult, but not certainly not impossible for them to get their money out and to make a profit. But it would have been much more difficult with me in the way as a, as a gross profit participant. So I said, fine, take me out of the way. You've done you know, that before, haven't you? Or something similar to that? I mean, you not that ex not to that extreme. Yeah. No, I've put money in I put money into Terminator 2 and I got it right back out. You know. Did this change you at all? I mean, having done this film and gone through all of this and the nature of the film, you come out of it how? Well, you know, I it's I found myself having to make a decision whether I wanted to go ahead with Terminator 3 or not. And in, and in post-production on Titanic, I was no longer interested. I realized these films are very hard to make, um, and you always have to be doing something new. And I felt I had gone into new territory as a, as a filmmaker in, in Titanic, places that people didn't expect me to go and be any good at. You know? and, and now we see the film is working, we're getting, we're getting good reviews. So I've proven that point you know, to, to myself and, and to the industry, so I can do other things now. You know? So I think it does change you. Um, you know, it also makes me realize that, that you, have to know, you have to know your limitations. You, know? you have to know the limitations of the filmmaking system. Not, not just my limitations, but all the people, all the very good people that I'm going to hire. There's a limit beyond which it gets away from you. you know? and, it, and, it, and it hurts, it hurts you. It hurts you financially and, and you know, it puts you in a situation of stress you don't want to be in as an artist. So I'm not going to make another $200 million film. I'm not going to make another three-hour movie. Uh, what are you going to do? 
Um, you know, I mean, I'll still, uh, I'm very happy to do, you know, a, a science fiction film or, or any film that's got big production numbers in it. I mean, make no mistake, I mean, I like that stuff, <laughs> yes, I know. you know, yeah. but I think, I think it's a question of, of not, uh, of, of knowing very clearly what the limitations are. I wanted to make this film so badly, I probably didn't admit the limitations to myself before the fact. I wanted to make this film really badly. How close did you come to making the movie you wanted to make? Pretty close. Pretty close. In fact, beyond I think what I thought we were doing. Uh, it was er, every film is is a is, is a discovery, you know, is a journey, and you find things about yourself and about your cast and about the material, you know, as you go along. I think the film exceeds what I what I set out to do, um, and that's a good feeling, you know, as as an artist because it doesn't always happen that way. James Cameron, thank you very much. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you.